So, cool tortoises. And then cybernetics was later split into two fields, AI and robotics. AI focused on the thinking aspect of, uh, 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 of robotics and uh, of cybernetics and robotics on the interaction with the environment. Uh, Matarek and others, she's one of many who believe that um, this was an impediment to both fields, um, that it split off like this, and it took some time for integrated thinking to return. It's still not totally returned, but these early people who were doing cybernetics were thinking about the agents that have bodies acting in the world and AI I think went off on a long tangent of disembodied intelligence and I've started to come to, around to that thinking way of thinking but I'm not I mean it's a pretty it's a pretty uh, orthodox way of thinking nowadays it, about about a decade ago I guess it was pretty heretical but it's now become more of a, an accepted thing that, that they really belong together and that you can't really develop intelligent systems if they're not embodied somehow. Um, you can build specialized systems that can solve problems and do certain things that are disembodied in computers but um, they really need to be together to develop generalized intelligence. So. You can't create Skynet without both. Yeah, you can't. I mean, if Skynet can't do anything besides, like, do some simulations, it's not very interesting, is it? <laughs> In our simulations, you humans are all dead. <laughs> Off. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, uh, Valentino Breitenberg was inspired by Walter's work to write the book Vehicles in 1984. Uh, it's a really famous book. Uh, I've been, this is one of these books that I want to find one day in a used bookstore, like a cool old copy, but I've never found one. Uh, Vehicles describes a number of thought experiments about the design of simple robots. He never built them himself, but others have used his work uh, as a basis of their own, and it's, um, he is pretty, Brilliant. I've seen online, there's, I don't know if it's the whole thing is online, but I've seen at least parts of it online. And they're really cool machines that he designed. Vehicles. Okay. AI. Uh, and it became an official field of study when Marvin Minsky, John McCarthy, Alan Newell, Herbert Simon, uh, and Herbert Simon participated, and others, participated in a conference at Dartmouth in 56. Um, and this is a quote from them. The conclusion of the meeting can be summarized as follows. Uh, uh, in order for machines to be intelligent, they will need to use the following. Internal models of the world. Okay, So they need to be able to have some internal model of the world that they're in. Um, search through possible solutions. Okay. So it has to be able to have a model and then search for possible solutions to like how do I get from here to there or something. Um, planning and reasoning to solve problems. Symbolic representation of information. Hierarchical system organization. And sequential program execution. Okay? So it doesn't actually have to solve, it doesn't actually have to execute the solution, it just has to Solutions. Yeah, so this is what the AI, the AI people were like, well, let's, let's work on like the thinking side, and this is what we'll work on. This is what AI will be, and this is the definition. And it's, it has created some really cool stuff, okay? Um, Google would be way worse, for instance, if it wasn't for these AI ideas. However, um, it did not, it, it fell far, far short of what they promised it would be able to do. Um, they thought this was going to be like, we were going to have these machines that were like, just like us, like really, you know, intelligent and 
could adapt to things and learn things and recognize images and all this stuff was going to happen. And it just sort of fizzled. Like that stuff didn't really happen. Now we still have a lot of those things like the machine. Uh, yeah, like, like these, these uh, technologies like uh, vision and uh, speak, speech recognition and that type of stuff all came out of that effort. Um, but they never, it was always way harder to do things than they thought it was going to be. Every single step of the way, it was like, oh, well, it'll be able to recognize objects in, in you know, a video stream. But actually, that's really hard to do. Um, and they can kind of do that now, but it's still not even that good. And that's why if you, uh, even if you use AI, those, those CAPTCHA things on those websites, those things are, they just like, oh, they just jumble up the letters a little bit and distort them. And AI stuff can't figure it out. Like, it totally freaks them out. They can't do it. A lot of the picture ones, AI has a higher success rate than humans. <laughs> well, it's, it's changed in recent years, which is why they've started to change them. But when they first started, they were better. And then AI caught up. It's kind of what yeah, happened. <laughs> um, so, and also speech recognition, natural language processing, that stuff was supposed to be easy, ends up, that it turns out it's way harder than, that, than they thought it was going to be. So, uh, a lot of cool stuff has happened from this. Like, I don't want to, like, poo-poo what is now called good old-fashioned AI, but uh, it, it did not do what they promised. Um, and... As far as you know, the robotics stuff, AI-inspired robotics, um, they first built these machines like Shaky and others um, using purely deliberative control based on these internal models and searching through all possible solutions and, and all that. And it, it just it wasn't effective for robotics. Um, they couldn't... Uh, essentially, the, the thinking was way too slow to react to the world in any reasonable way. It's, it would like move to a point, these robots based on this, move to a point, sit there and think for a while, and then move a little bit further and sit there and think for a while. It just isn't uh, uh, something that was an effective way of going about it. So later we will learn more about how uh, more modern types of robot control work. Um, a lot of them are reactive control, which actually goes back to the cybernetics thing. Um, just like really basic, like sensors uh, that trigger some sort of response. Like, oh, if you have this sort of sensor situation, do this. Like, there's not a lot of logic that goes into it. It doesn't have a model of the world oftentimes. It's just really basic. Um, just sensory input and reaction. And if you design the robot well, you can get behaviors out of it that are actually really complex or, or useful. So uh, we'll talk about that hybrid and behavior-based control as well. Uh, of the three key fields of study that comprise much of the history of robotics, control theory, cybernetics, uh, and AI, all three are still active areas of research, although the term cybernetics has gone out of style in favor of the terms. Uh, such terms as biomimetic robots and the like. So um, we kind of hit on this. So the simple manipulation-based AI, sometimes called good old-fashioned AI, uh, is still being developed, but mostly outside of the field of robotics. Why might it have failed to achieve uh, artificial intelligence and robotics? I think that's a question I'll leave with you because we kind of got to get moving a little bit. Um, emergent behavior is totally awesome, but it's usually discovered by accident. And I kind of want to hear what you guys, because this is something that I'm interested in. Um, so we'll see something like flocking. We'll, so you'll have like a lot of little robots out there that um, have really simple rules. And if you contrive things correctly, like the rules correctly, the programming correctly, the geometry correctly, the environment correctly, they will exhibit flocking behavior, just like birds do, um, or many uh, ground-running animals that all run together. Um, it herd sort of 
uh, flocking as well. And so flocking is an emergent behavior that comes from like really simple rules. You, you're not telling, no one robot knows anything about the flock or flocking. All it knows is I'm trying to stay this far away from my neighbors, but not further than this other distance away. Like I want to be like in this middle distance away from all my neighbors. And if, you, if all of them are trying to do that, Separately, it actually, this emergent behavior occurs globally where they flock. And wall following is another one that's an easy one. Um, the, the ants and the pheromone trails. With it. So another thing that ants can do really well is they can somehow find the nearest food source to the nest. Like, very consistently they don't all end up going to the one that's further away. Um, and so they've done tests on them, and like they like put food sources at like different places, and then like, how do they consistently find the closest one? And because it seems like that would require knowledge of like where all of them are, right? Some, somebody has got to be able to know where all of them are to know which one's closest, right? I mean, it seems like it, but actually nobody knows any distance, <laughs> what's really happening is there, well, they think, is that there are these uh, the pheromone trails that they leave behind them, and they have this sort of decay that, that it, it dissipates. So they always leave these pheromone trails behind them, and uh, they have this very simple sort of algorithm, seemingly, about their behavior. So if they're looking for food, they leave the nest, and they head out, and if they cross a pheromone trail, they follow it. <coughs> And if they cross the one that's stronger, they follow the, the one that's stronger, okay? That's like until they get to the food, and then they bring the food back. That's like, that's like essentially the whole plan. Um, and somehow this turns into this other behavior where they get to the closest food source. Like they all clump on the closest food source. And the way that it works is that uh, the trails that are most used uh, are going to have, or, or most recently used, are going to be the ones that ants have been on most recently. And the ones that have the shortest distance back um, are going to be traversed more frequently and will have a stronger pheromone set. So just that little simple algorithm will actually lead them to the one that's closest. If an ant goes a long ways away, finds food, and brings it back, then that pheromone trail is going to be super dissipated by the time the other ants encounter it. So that's the kind of the algorithm that works. And so this emergent behavior is really cool, but uh, it's usually discovered by accident. Or we see something that's like emergent in animals, and we're like, how can we make stuff do that? Uh, how might d a designer design for emergent? How could you go about designing for this stuff to happen? You have to know what you want it to happen. Right, so say you like have something, you, like, you want to achieve something. Like you want something to happen. Um, but you, want, you, want, you don't want to have to put this really complex model into your robot. You don't want you know, uh, a bunch of high level thinking and vision systems and all that stuff happening. You want just like basic programming. Could you do something simple that was just very effective at showing this emerging behavior? The pattern. Can you program a pattern? Program what? Like a pattern. It does it a couple times, and that's what it should do. So, but you're still you're still relying on it on it finding that behavior, right, yeah. accidentally. But what if you like wanted to just be like, ha like I, want, I want these robots to, um, to start, um, I don't know, cir like getting into circles. Like they want, I want them to like circle up into circles. Yeah. So, so there's like, Depending on what you do, there's these strategies, like you were talking about, like the optimization, if you want to really optimize something, so then you can mimic like, the ant strategy, and bees do exactly the same thing, but with their dance, right? So uh -huh. the, 
the better the food source, the longer their dance is. And so the longer their dance is, the more bees observe that dance and know where to go. And then it then optimizes that, um, that transition, I guess, with that transaction. They also optimize the, the where the flowers are in relation to the hive. And then they, they've done pattern recognition for when the bees are out. They, they optimize what, how many of them they can get to in, in each flight. Because they can only carry so much pollen back. They're, they're be honeybees are really neat for that. Yeah. And then like another strategy would be that um, if there was a space, um, a sort of a space problem or something, I was reading about the, uh, talking about fractal systems mm -hmm. and your circulatory system is a fractal system where it like, there's no cell that's um, five cells or more than five cells away from a, a blood vessel, yet it only takes up like 5% of your body. So it's something that's everywhere, but not anywhere, right? It's crazy. So anything, like, something like that, you model mm -hmm. your programming in those sort of strategies, and then maybe have lots of iterations and simulation to find the right one. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so that, uh, yeah, I think that you're right. You you can identify sort of strategies that that can help with that. Um, sort of design strategies that can help with that, and and I also think that that thing you mentioned at the end, that sort of evolutionary approach, is pretty, pretty powerful, pretty powerful. There are some other people. Yeah, uh, so is, with like an ant, like if we were to program an ant, when you say develop emergent behavior, mm -hmm. so you just describe the entire process to me. It's literally a greater than or equal to uh, this line versus the next line. Mm -hmm. This line greater, go. If not, go to the next line. Yep. It's literally that simple. That doesn't sound very complex to me to program. Right. It doesn't sound like an emergent system to me. So to me, if you're saying like an emergent system, you're saying program that ant, let that ant decide that that method is the best method. That would be, to me, an emergent quality within that program. Ah, so I think that it's just a matter of the terminology. So, okay. so emergent behavior is usually what we'll call it, or emergent systems. What it pretty much means is that what you explicitly tell it to do isn't super complicated, but it still exhibits some sort of complex behavior. Okay. Um, and so it's that word can be used in other contexts as well. Like emergent can be can mean like the sort of uh, adaptive learning. Capability, right. yeah, and that that use of it is not typical in this context, but yeah. So I, I think it's important to recognize the use of the term is a little bit subtly different than it can be interpreted uh, different ways. So yeah, but it is. I mean, I think the idea, though, right? I mean, the idea with these emergent systems, we design them in part because we hope one day we'll understand how to design well enough to design something that can itself have this sort of like emergence of adaptation. Uh, and that, that's like an intelligent system. Um, these basic levels, I mean, they're not. Like the, the ant's not intelligent. But there's, the theory is nowadays, the leading theories on artificial intelligence now pretty much say that maybe, maybe intelligence isn't so complex after all. And maybe if we understand these basic levels of intelligence better, we'll be able to see how to do this higher level intelligence and learning and all of that um, at that point. And maybe we'll be able to build systems then that actually can like adapt to its their environment and like you could send up just something up in a spaceship to Mars and like you don't know what it's like what it's going to encounter or have to do when it's up there but it'll be able to do all kinds of things because it's has this sort of emergent uh, quality to it where it can it can grow and it's it's understanding so just, yeah I think that we're using them kind of different terms uh, to, in different ways, but I think that they aren't, they aren't totally unrelated either. Um, okay, so 
some of the nitty gritty robot components. So our definition suggests several types of components that are required for a robot instantiation. One, it's got to have a body. So it has the potential to act on its environment. Two, it's got to have sensors so it can sense its environment. Three, it's got to have effectors and actuators so it can act on its environment. We'll talk about the difference between an effector and an actuator um, in a moment. And it has to have a controller so it can be autonomous. And that controller doesn't necessarily have to be, but often is, some sort of computer, right? It doesn't have to be, but it often is. Um, so let's consider each broad class of components in turn. So embodiment is the first. Uh, without a body, a robot could not act on its environment. Of course, a rock has a body, so embodiment alone does not uh, make something a robot. Uh, the primary implication of embodiment for robots is that they are subject to the physical laws of nature. Uh, these are limitations, but also opportunities. They require power, can collide with things, and can take a long time to perform a task, but they can potentially harvest energy, avoid collisions, and perform tasks quickly. They're embroiled in the same buzzing, frothy mess of the world we are, and this makes designing a robot a serious challenge. It really is. And I think that um, what, we're, what we're building in this class is going to be, under our definition, a form of robot. It's going to have to, well, I don't know. I, I said it has to be um, uh, reactive. Um, it, it it has to. I think that it will require some sort of active element to it, and I would be a little disappointed if we didn't use an active element in it. But it's good to think: could we solve this without an active element? It's always good to to ask that question. So. Um, in this case, I'm going to artificially try to make it so you can't do it with a passive element alone. Um, Just put a pillow there. Right, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to require some things of it that, that um, you can't do with a passive element. But maybe in the specific you know, real world application, a foam pad might be the solution. But in this case, it won't be because I will artificially make it not the solution because I want you guys to use automation to solve it. Um, but uh, I, think, and I think it just depends on your, on your situation, whether or not it's the right choice. And I think that there's a tendency to use too much automation nowadays. Um, the really cool stuff that people used to do with mechanisms and hydraulics and all of this is I feel like we lose that a lot now with automation um, you don't really need a robot to do a whole lot of stuff <laughs> There's a lot of stuff you can do without it. but anyways uh, okay so sensing sensors are dynamic systems that interact with their environment and can indicate part of the state of their environment. Sensors allow robots to sense or perceive their environment. Uh, depending on the robot's task, it will require certain types of sensors and not others. Later, we will consider several classes of sensors. Using sensors, a robot is able to at least partially estimate its internal state in the system dynamical sense of a minimal set of variables that completely describe the robot's response at a given time. So remember our, our state space models, so the state variables were there to describe the state of the system, right? And the sensors are able to measure those. We can't always measure every state though. Oftentimes we can only measure some of the states. Um, but the more the merrier, if we can, if we can sense all the states, that's great. Um, so uh, a robot um, 
can also be made aware of the state of its environment or external state through sensing. A robot's and its environment's state may or may not be completely described by its sensors. This gives three possibilities. So it could be that it's an observable system, which means that state is completely sensed. So the state of the robot and its environment, the whole system, is completely sensed. So every single state variable that you would use to describe how it behaves, uh, you would be able to measure. Okay. That is ideal. Uh, you like that. that is, that's great. Uh, partially observable is the case where the state is partially sensed, or the last case is when it's unobservable, meaning that, that the state is not sensed at all. Um, typically, a robot's going to perform best when it has a full, a full observability of its, of its system, uh, and worse when it has full unobservability. So if it has no senses, first off, it's not really going to be a robot anymore. Uh, but it, it has no ability to react to the environment at all. So it sucks. Sensorless robots are just not even robots. I don't even consider them robots. Um, <laughs> it's OK, yeah. They're not very sensitive. <laughs> um, so uh, there are obviously going to be trade-offs between fully unobservable and fully observable. Okay, uh, so most likely no sensors is not is not the solution, and most likely. Tons of sensors is not going to be the solution either. I mean, it might, but hopefully you can get away with fewer sensors. The fewer you can, you can have and still perform well, the better, right? So that's what we like. Uh, although there are some situations where you want extra sensors that are redundant, because if one sensor fails, you still want to be able to sense things. So that. There are some cases where you do need redundancy and all that. Sensor for the sensors. That's right. Also, when you design, a good thing to always keep in mind, try to make it so that you know when your sensor goes bad. <laughs> if you don't know when your sensor goes bad, uh, that could cause a lot of problems. So There are like, there's like the, the normally on, normally mm -hmm. off, possibilities of, of sensors so for instance if you have like a, a well try to design it so that if it fails it changes state and you know that that means it was failed because you have some other reason to believe it could be failed so the little error button fault that stuff all comes from a designer who thought it would be good to know if the sensor goes bad. So it's, it's important. Okay. Uh, good. State variables are variables that describe state, right? Um, and they can be either discrete, for example, a binary field would be one possibility. Um, so you could have like a binary field could mean like you could be on these concrete pads, you'd be on that pad or that pad or that pad or this pad. Those are discrete states. Maybe those are the only, like you could be either here, there, here, there, or there, or there. Those are the only states of the system. Um, oftentimes there are more, even if it's discrete, but that's discrete. Continuous means you could be anywhere. You could have some position described by real numbers. Uh, in space. So that's continuous. Okay, uh, state space is the set of all possible states. The figure below shows a table that includes the entire state space for a simple robot. So, it's, this robot has a left bump sensor. It can either be on or off. It can either be pressed or not pressed. A right bump sensor that can be on or off. Uh, a battery sensor that can either be high or low. 
probably needs more sensors, but okay, maybe it can do some basic stuff. So all of the possibilities of what states this system could be in are listed in this table. So the battery could be high, left bump and right bump could be on, or etc, etc. They could be any of those situations. Now, a robot might have an internal model or representation that can be used to describe the environment, which is great. Um, doesn't have to always, though. A robot's sensor space or perceptual space is the set of all possible states it can sense. Okay? All right, so that's all about sensors. Uh, we're going to go a little long today, but we're hopefully not going to go too super long. I just want to, we've had some good discussions. This is kind of longer than I thought. Uh, technically, this class is till 4.50, because I guess they assume you take 20 minutes of break. I don't think we took 20 minutes of break, though. But we probably took 15, so we can go a little extra. Uh, all right. So, action. Um, robots actuators move its effectors in order to interact with its environment. So, the two primary interactions are locomotion... So you move around. It does say 450 for, the cl for this class. For this class, yeah, I know it does. So I think it assumes you take two 10-minute breaks because it's supposed to be 150 minutes. 50 times 3 is 150. That's how I got there. Uh, and so, yeah. So I don't know. I Last year I always went three hours. And I'm like, this year maybe that's... Actually, less is more, but I'm already blowing past 4.30, so we'll see. Okay. Um, locomotion and manipulation. So either you got to move around or you got to move something. Those are like the two main things that a robot does. Uh, in fact, there are uh, the two primary subfields of robotics are mobile robotics, which studies robots that move on the ground and through the air and through the water. Uh, and manipulator robots, uh, which uh, robotics, which studies the uh, robots that manipulate objects, typically via a robotic arm. You can have a mobile manipulator, but uh, some are just stationary manipulator robots. So they're just like a robot arm that's planted somewhere in the ground, and it can just do stuff around it, but it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, if it moves through space, yeah, I guess you have a space robot. I don't know. We didn't. We, I guess I didn't. I didn't include that. Yep, no space robots allowed. Uh, power and its relation to computation. So, as with many other technologies, and especially mobile technologies, robots have important power demands. In animals. Brains demand a relatively large amount of power relative to the rest of its body. In robots, power uh, processing, or processing power is relatively small, and actuation power is relatively high. So that's like a little bit different than in, in biological systems. Yeah, so it can depend. It can depend. I mean, it's, um, cloud-based robotic stuff has this sort of weird niche in robotics because most of the time we think of the robot as being self-contained um, but if it runs if it has some server running stuff for it and then it, it just gets the results um, I don't know I guess it could be like a divinely inspired robot <laughs> I know what I want to do from the clouds <laughs> Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> so, all right. Autonomy. Through hardware and software, controllers allow a robot to be autonomous. From sensor inputs, controllers determine actuator and therefore effector outputs. Autonomy is the ability to act in an environment without significant guidance from an outside user. Um, effectors and actuators. So, painting with broad brush strokes here, um, 
The difference between an effector and an actuator is that actuators are the components that drive the effectors, which in turn interact with the environment. So the actuators, sometimes we, sometimes we uh, group these together a little too much. We should differentiate them a little bit more. Um, the actuators are things like the motors and the pneumatic cylinders and the uh, piezoelectric actuators, that type of stuff. The things that make things move, um, where the power, electrical usually power goes into and then is, is uh, uh, put into the effector, which is something like an arm or a gripper or a wheel or a propeller or a fin. None of those things can do anything unless they're powered by an actuator. So it's kind of the idea, or a rotor, or any of those things. Okay, active versus passive. So you pretty much can get the idea. It, well, so uh, passive actuation happens by just harvesting the potential energy around it um, and using it. Pretty cool, and actually, like a strong yeah. So, so biological systems do this a lot. We do this some in uh, walking, actually. But look at this. This is not the power. Sino Lab at the Nagoya Institute of Technology have developed a passive walking robot designed to walk using only its own weight, without any motors, sensors, computers, or electricity. To begin walking, all this robot requires is a push. And then they just set up on treadmill just slightly down here. Pretty cool, I would say. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with that. Okay. But most most of the time you use an active actuator. Um, and here are some common ones. Motors. Hydraulic actuators, which use fluid pressure. Uh, pneumatic actuators, which use some sort of gas um, to actuate things. Uh, and then there are smart material actuators as well. So piezoelectric or shape memory alloys. Um, really cool. Here's a shape memory alloy uh, robotic hand. And it shows you all the details, and I re recommend you do look. But this one is pneumatic, I think. Or it could be hydraulic. I think it might be pneumatic, though. They're using lab view. Pretty cool. The music is just building. But you see all those tubes. The tubes are actually the actuators. The, the tubes have pressurized air in them. It's pretty cool. Okay. Motors. Yeah. We have a lot of those. We use these a lot. There's a pretty good chance that your project is going to use a motor, actually. Um, I give it a 50-50 chance that, you, that you, you end up using a motor. Um, uh, rotational motion, typically, electrical to mechanical rotational motion. Um, DC motors, I put this video here because I know we've all uh, learned about DC motors, but this video is a particularly beautiful illustration of how they work. Um, and I would recommend you just take a few minutes you know, get a, get a cup of coffee, glass of whiskey, whatever you like. Sit down and just enjoy this. this it's really nice. I recommend it. It's like a couple of minutes. Um, and we've talked about how they work before in uh, mechatronics class, but this section kind of reviews that a little bit. I encourage you to do that. Uh, I do want to talk about a couple things to do with them that are more practical design things and not just like how they work. Um, uh, there are two 
obvious trade-offs with a, uh, a DC motor or with electro electrical motor in any case, um, but definitely DC motors as the a typical example. Um, torque, current, and uh, angular velocity voltage. Um, so there are uh, also power considerations. So for constant power, one must trade off angular velocity and torque. At low speeds, high torque is possible. At high speeds, we typically are left with low torque. It sucks, but it's true, and you just have to do, deal with it. Um, typical DC motors have unloaded angular speeds of uh, 3,000 to 9,000 RPM. Uh, this is much too fast for most robotics applications, which require low speeds and high torque. Technically, we could work with uh, work in this regime with high current and low voltage, okay? You can do it, like low speeds, um, but you can pump a bunch of current through it. However, uh, there are three big problems with that, okay? Problem one, this would require high current, which many circuits cannot do well, okay? Running a lot of current around, uh, you have to have special components that can handle that much current, and it's dangerous. I also didn't mention that when you run a lot of current around. It's dangerous. So you don't want to run a lot of current around for several reasons. Uh, two, high currents means lots of heating, which can melt shit. This is my way. I had written that out, S-H-I-T, before, and I realized that probably I shouldn't have it so that you could search for, it, for the swear word, so I just put an emoji. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, heat rate is I squared over R, so I is bad for heat. Um, and three, DC motors tend to be inefficient at high current because you get losses to heat. So you don't really want to run them like that. So. What do we do? Gears. We use gears. Because you can, you can trade off torque and speed. So if you want to go slower, which is often the case, you want to go slower, you use a gear, um, usually a gear box that you buy off the shelf. But you could design your own gears in there if you'd like to, gears on shafts, depending on what it is. Um, gearing can be traded, uh, can be used to trade off speed and torque. Gears are pretty efficient, so the transmitted power is approximately conserved. Um, uh, yeah, so that's the idea. We, we've talked about gears before too, so um, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, when using gears, we do have to worry about backlash, right? So the teeth don't mesh perfectly, and so you end up with uh, a, a gear that if you're driving it one way and you turn the other way and you reverse it, there's this backlash that happens in between. And you guys have felt this, I'm sure, uh, on lots of different things, but one, one place in particular that it's very obvious is if you ever have used a, uh, a manual CNC machine, or, or not CNC machine, uh, a, a manual mill, and if you guys ever use the drive screw, and then you were like, you went a little too far, and you're like, oh, I'll just back it off a hair. That is backlash. That's actually a power screw backlash, but it's exactly the same with gears. You get that, it won't quite respond until it engages again when you go the other way. So that backlash stuff will kill you when if you're trying to base your um, position on how much you've turned something. Because you get turning happening on one side, one shaft, and it's not happening on the other shaft yet. So uh, that's why you need sensors, you need some sort of feedback on your end that you're actually turning because to get rid of the backlash stuff. That's the easiest way to get rid of it, at least. Um, and essentially, you can't get rid of it. You just work around it. <laughs> but 
yes. Servo motor. So another type of motor that's very useful in robotics is a servo motor. Actually, servo motors are just DC motors. They're usually um, used with gear reduction um, and angular position sensor um, and feedback controller to, conti to control the position. Uh, they're especially useful for robot arm and other effector positioning. Um, they're so they're not all, they're not always going to come with a gear reduction built in. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, often we will reduce them gear ratio for a given application. Um, the angular position sensor. Almost every servo motor either has one when you buy it off the shelf or it comes with a rear shaft that is built to have an encoder put onto it. We'll talk about encoders later. Uh, and feedback control, um, you, may, that, you may be the designer. So you, you might go buy a servo motor and essentially all it might mean is this is one that you will want to use for uh, feedback control. There are lower cost DC motors that are not called servo motors and they're just not built quite as um, uh, tight as far as their, their uh, specs go. So servo motors tend to be a higher quality DC motor. So when you're doing robotic stuff, a lot of times you care about the positioning and stuff like that, very precise positioning. And servo motors are going to be the way to go. I just sourced some servo motors uh, with encoders built onto them, not that it's hard to put them on, but, uh, and the motors and encoders together cost a hair under $500 each. They're not cheap. It's small, but it's not, it's not, it's not, I mean, so you can get like the baby DC motors that are like two bucks or whatever. Um, you can do some stuff with those. I'm not saying you can't do anything with those, but if you're going to get like an industrial application one, like you're going to spend like 500 bucks on one with an encoder. That's probably 400 without the encoder. And then the encoders cost 100 bucks, so you might as well just pay for them to put the encoder on it anyway. So, yeah. So I just give you an idea of what these things cost. They're not cheap. Um, Okay, PWM, pulse width modulation, is how you are mostly going to control them. Um, and we'll talk more about that later on. You guys will probably be using PWM in your project. Because I don't have any linear amplifiers around here, so PWM is cheaper and uh, easier in a lot of ways. You can buy these motor driver chips. It used to be way, way harder. Um, okay. Mostly we're doing position control with robotics, right? You want to position the effector somewhere so that it does something for you. However, if you tell, say you have a robot arm and you tell it, move to this position, uh, and it encounters an obstacle on its way, and maybe that obstacle is a fleshy person or something like that, um, it depending on the controller algorithm that you have for it, uh, if it's position control, most likely it's going to ramp up its torque super high to make it go to that position. Like, so if it's stuck, most of the time you're going to start flowing more and more current through it. Like if you've got an integrator on there and it has some error, then that error is there because it's pinned a person against something. <laughs> let's say, uh, and it wants to go further this way, but it can't because that person is there. It will, it will just, just unleash all of the current and it'll just be like the torque will just ramp up more and more and more. It's trying to get to that last position and that's how it kills people. And these things have killed people. It's like not really funny, but um, <laughs> the way that I described it might have been funny, but it wasn't. It's not actually funny because people have actually died that way. Um, so. An alternative way of doing this uh, is what they call torque control, and it's much safer to do torque control. Um, the problem is, uh, you, you might say, okay, like, well, you can control with torque, but uh, 
you really want the, at the end of the day you still want the position right like you can control the torque all day but I didn't want that robot arm to exhibit you know five newton meters what I wanted is it to go there so how does that work so what you have to do is you have to build a model <coughs> that will turn your torque control output into a position so you have to have a model that will essentially interpret your torque control and do the positioning for you. So you need to know what torque is necessary to go to the position. So you do sort of this position loop around the outside and then you do a torque loop on the inside. And what it does is it makes it so that you aren't going to, it, you, can, you, have much more, you have much better control over your torque and you're not going to hurt people is the idea. So it's not perfect though. And most of the time, uh, uh, we still are very cautious with robots because we can do things accidentally that are very dangerous. And in this project, I think I chose one that's fairly safe. We can design something that's fairly safe, but I'll be doing design reviews with you because um, it could easily be like a pinch point here. And if your controller is like, like if your hand gets caught in there and the controller is like, hmm need to go harder like harder and it just just keeps going then you're in big trouble so i you got to be cautious still even with a small application like this um and we'll be we'll be cautious degrees of freedom there's that happening um uh, and you know degrees uh, I'll, i'm kind of wrapping it up here um the good number of degrees of freedom essentially the number of ways you can move, number of sort of dimensions that are uh, necessary to describe the motion that you're going to have. Um, if the number of degrees of freedom uh, it is equal to the number of controllable degrees of freedom in your system, then we call them holonomic. Okay. So that means that like, you can actuate in any direction you want. Like a helicopter is like this. It can go up or down or side to side. It's pretty close to a holonomic robot. However, oftentimes, robots are non-holonomic, which means that we can't control all of the degrees of freedom directly. So a, robot, a, a car, for instance, can go forward, and it can turn, but it can't, it can't pivot, right? car can't pivot so there's lots of stuff that it can't it can't do it's hard to orient itself in a certain way so it's actually much harder to control things non-holonomic non systems if you can arbitrarily actuate in any direction it's way easier to, to do that if you can't if you're limited and you have to sort of you know do a three-point turn <laughs> uh, then it's harder uh, and then you can have um, a robot arm for instance is has more controllable degrees of freedom than total degrees of freedom. So it can actually, like, there might be two different joints that could m cause motion in a certain direction. Um, and so you can have redundancy. Not, not all robot arms are redundant, but some of them are. Um, okay. So... I'm going to talk about locomotion and then we're going to be done. So pretty much locomotion, you can either do it stably where you are always, if you, if you just stopped suddenly and didn't do anything, um, you wouldn't fall over. Um, uh, so if you're stably locomoting, then that's like the easiest way to go, right? Because then like you're not going to tip over easily. However, some of the best ways to get around, turns out, are dynamically uh, uh, unstable. Um, so, or, yeah, they're dynamically unstable. So, for instance, if you want to walk, the walking is dynamically unstable. Um, because if you were to freeze mid-stride, you would tip over, right? Um, and so what you need is this dynamic stability is this, these control systems that are keeping you stable while you're dynamically unstable. Like you, if you were to stop, boom, you would crash. Uh, and actually, those systems 
are like the best ones though. It turns out those are the ones that get us around much faster, which is why we care about them. Um, you can see like the dynamically stable ones, they'll make like a hexapod robot, which like always has at least three points of contact and its center of mass is always in the center uh, of those, of the triangle. So it's like, and, like it, it works, but it's kind of slow and it is, uh, not nearly as fast, it can't do things like, um, it can't go to like a full sprint where it's like running with strides or like shh, shh, shh. Like if you had like a, most animals actually are dynamically stable but not statically stable in their locomotion. Okay, you may have noticed that this was longer than we, we anticipated um, and I did not get to the project discussion. So what I'm going to do um, is we're going to set up a Slack chat uh, and as far as you guys trying to figure out for me what the requirements are for the project because um, the project, here is the customer need. This is my description and it's going to give you an idea of what I want, but it's not going to give you what you need, which are the design requirements. Okay. So you need to figure out specifications that must be met in order to meet the customer needs. So this is what I think I need right here, but it does not give you specifically what kind of, what kind of specifications you're going to need to design for. So these need to be as explicit as possible and are often quantitative. In other words, um, there might be like a maximum dimension of this or something. Uh, and like you guys were already asking me these questions, so they come very naturally. Like, how high is something going to drop from? How big are these things? Are they different? Are they the same? Those are the types of questions that you need to be asking. Um, develop the design requirements by querying the customer for specifics. So that's what we're going to do on Slack offline. I'll set that up, and then you guys can start asking me questions, and we'll develop this set of design requirements. Okay? All right. What? It's going to be pretty hectic. I know. I will definitely have a puppy sitting on my lap while I respond. So maybe that'll help. You are posting this video when the Uh, Probably tomorrow. 